Thank you. Just as we come down the home stretch, let's just, maybe we should just stretch a little. Just stretch to the, to the left. Stretch, stretch. Some people have already stood up and are already. <laughs> Let the blood flow a bit. Let it flow a bit. It's a powerful day. By the time you're done, your mind, your mind would, would feel full, right? That's the way the platform is. It's powerful in that way. For those of us still here with us, this is the platform Nigeria. We're still here live at the Covenant Place, Igomu, Lagos. And our next speaker is Professor Patrick Lumumba. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Thank you so much. On his behalf, let me thank you for that warm welcome. Professor P. L. O. Lumumba is a distinguished scholar and legal luminary holding a Doctor of Laws in the Law of the Sea from University of Ghent, Belgium, as well as a Master of Laws and Bachelor of Laws from the University of Nairobi. He has received Honorary Doctor of Letters degrees from the University of Cape Town of Cape Coast, Ghana, and a Doctor of Science degree from Bell's University of Technology here in Nigeria. With a rich background in human rights, humanitarian law, and international humanitarian law, Professor Lumumba has served as an advocate in the High Courts of Kenya and Tanganyika, and is a certified mediator. His influence extends beyond the legal realm. <laughs> Welcome, Professor Lumumba. I'm a great opponent of lengthy introductions. <laughs> Let me start by thanking the pastor and his wife, and also appreciating those who have spoken before me and those who are present to listen to our presentation. Without you, we would be talking to ourselves. There is a sense in which much has been said. If it is the history of the continent, slavery that has been mentioned, if it is colonization that has been spoken to, if it is neo-colonization that has been spoken to, if it is in describing the continent of Africa as having been divided so very arbitrarily in Berlin in 1884 and 1885, that has been spoken to. And we have been told so very correctly how that continues to bedevil the continent of Africa and to undermine her attempts at unity. Those of you who are students of history will remember that in 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and in 1964 in Cairo, Egypt, the debate was, should we redraw the boundaries? It was agreed by the founding fathers then that that would be an exercise in failing conflict and that if we were moving towards unity, then redrawing boundaries was unnecessary. The OAU was of course founded in 1963, a weak organization which as it were introduced the concept of inviolability of boundaries and placed emphasis on sovereignty. We have been told that that could very well be the reason why Africa's growth has been stunted. 
There are those and there's them who has told us so very effectively that upon consultation with the gods, he has been told very useful things. And the gods are right in the revelation that they have made. The gods, the gods are right in saying that we have suffered in many ways and continue to do so. And that therefore the post-independence African country or countries are bedeviled by many things. That could be a reason. It has also been said that part of the reason why we have not realized our potential is because we make the wrong choices. And that could very well be true. And my brother who spoke about choices so very well told us that it all rests on the choices that you make. And you who are Christians will remember that at critical moments, even in the Christian tradition, it has always been a question of choices. If you read the book of First Kings at chapter 18, when there is conflict in that little place called Israel, Elijah summons them and says, choose you now. If Baal is God, bring the 450 disciples of Baal and the 400 of Asherah who dine with Jezebel. And if God is God, let him be worshipped. If Baal is Baal, let him be worshipped. Perhaps that is the reason why we are where we are. We never make the right choices. We choose Baal when we should be choosing God. There are those who have said possibly, and you see this choice if you read the book of Joshua chapter 24, when he calls the Israelites and tells them, choose you now. Do you want to worship the gods whom your ancestors worshipped before they crossed the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Perhaps we are not serving the gods and that the gods are angry. And in the anger, they continue to visit pain upon us. So there is a sense in which all and many things have been talked about. But Africa sometimes judges ourselves very harshly. And with a jaundiced sense of history. The post-colonial African state, the oldest post-colonial African state is Ghana. 66 years only. Nigeria, 63 years only. And we often forget these very important and immortal words of John Henry Clark when he said that all African countries upon regaining independence started to conduct their affairs on the basis of systems of governments that were borrowed from Europe and that none of them will ever succeed on the basis of borrowed systems. And as if he were a Jewish prophet, he is being proven right on a daily basis. Because whenever we in the African countries think that we have identified the problem and that we have identified the antidote, when we apply the antidote, new wounds appear. That has been the state of Africa. And that continues to be our state. And therefore, when we judge Africa, we must ask ourselves, from whose lens are we judging Africa? When in 1965, the Osagie Kwame Nkrumah wrote the book, Neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism, and the most dangerous, he was right, and he was overthrown for it, because the colonizer left, but never left. And if you have any doubt, see what is happening in Niger, in Guinea, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, they are alive and well. And Africa remains the only continent in the world that is still referred to as Francophone, Anglophone, Lusophone, and now we are beginning to even call it Russophone and Sinophone and Indophone. <laughs> there is a sense in which we must never forget this. So that when we are judging Africa, we ought to judge our on the basis and upon the realization that the headwinds that stand on our path are numerous and that are, there is no shortage of fifth columnists 
within our ranks. The SMO spoke. And if the SMO were to speak a little longer, he would have reminded you of what Chinua Achebe said in Things Fall Apart, that they came and put the things that held us together, and we can no longer reason as one. And he said, we may have sent the white man away, but what about our brothers whose minds they have infected and infested? And there is no shortage of them. So Africa can and will arise. And if you look at the continent of Africa, she has always been conscious of the need to do right things. And if you look at the continent since 1963, and I can remember this so very vividly, I can remember Kwame Nkrumah in 1957 on the 6th of March saying, the freedom of Ghana means nothing if the rest of Africa is not free. He says the same thing in 1958. He repeats the same thing in 1960 in Casablanca, Morocco. He repeats it again on 25th of May, 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where he tells the 32 states of states gathered there, we must live here with one army. We must live here with one currency. We must live here with one foreign policy coordinated and I even suggest that we can have a capital, and I suggest Bangui in Central African Republic because it is the most central, but we listen to him not. After that, of course, we have had our gains. Under the aegis of the OAU, Africa was able to eliminate apartheid South Africa. Under the aegis of the OAU, Africa was able to chase away the Portuguese in Cabo Verde, in Angola, in Mozambique, in Guinea, Bissau. Under the aegis of the OAU, Africa was able to chase away the apartheid regime in what is now Namibia and the Ian Smith regime in what is now Zimbabwe. Let us not judge ourselves too harshly. We have made our mistakes, but sometimes it is proper, as my sister said, that we see half full glass rather than half empty. We must not debilitate ourselves by constantly bashing ourselves and looking at Africa from jaundiced eyes from Europe and America. And I'm suggesting to you, we have and will continue to make our mistakes. Look at Africa and the decision that she has made for ourselves over the years. As early as 1980, Africans sitting here in Lagos, Nigeria, came up with the Lagos Plan of Action. And the Lagos Plan of Action told Africa, in order for Africa to realize our potential, we must trade amongst ourselves. But the neocolonizer was not resting. A little earlier, five years earlier, the neocolonizers had sat down in Lome, in Togo, not too far from here, and came up with an agreement of African and European and Pacific countries. And when that did not work, they sat again in Cotonou here in Benin and came up with the Cotonou Agreement. They are never resting. We must never forget that. The neocolonialists are alive and well and is always trying to frustrate what we do because Africa is their hunting ground. And we did not stop there. When we are doing things, you tell me what Africa has not tried to do. In terms of the airspace, we agreed in Yamasukru in La Côte d'Ivoire, that we will open our airspaces in 1988. We sat in Abuja here in Nigeria in 2001 and said we were going to spend not less than 15% of our budget in the health sector. We sat in Malabo, Equatorial Guinea in 2014 and said we were going to focus on agriculture. We sat down in Maputo in 2013 and said we were going to ensure that our women were mainstreamed in the activities of Africa. We sat down in Abuja in 2013, in 2014 and said we were going to have free movement of people and once again sat down in Kigali, Rwanda 2018 and said we were going to eliminate visas. We sat down in Abuja and said that we were going to silence the guns in 2013. We did not. And we sat down in 2020 and said we were going to silence them. And now the guns are alive and well. 
And who are supplying us with the weapons? It is not us. It is others. Should we blame them? Yes, we should. Should we blame ourselves? Yes, we should. So Africa has always been a battleground. And the rhetoric that we see and the manner in which we ourselves are educated. My sister talked about education. But really, what are we teaching ourselves? It is fella Nicola Pokuti said, teacher, don't teach me nonsense. And I'm suggesting to us that most of us, including most of us who are here, we are so very thoroughly miseducated that what we must do is to unlearn the burden that we have in our mind. Those of us who are lawyers, when, we, when do we feel happiest? When we cite an English authority to determine a land case in, in, in a Belkuta? When we talk about the reasonable man, we don't talk about the reasonable man in, uh, in a keke, in a papa. We talk about the reasonable man being the man in the Clapham omnibus in London, England. That is how miseducated we are. And until we are re-educated, we who are present here are part of the danger to Africa. Because even in our unguarded moments, I went several years ago, to the university at Harvard and talking to students and one of them said that Harvard was the best school in law, in teaching of law. I said, whose law? Nigerian law? Ugandan law? Zimbabwean law? They can only be best in teaching their law, not ours. And I have seen we, we who are in this space of education Somebody spends six years at Unilag, and when they go to Harvard or Stanford for three weeks for a short course where they spend most of the time taking tea, he comes back and says, an alumni of Harvard. <laughs> so the time is now. The time is now to begin re-educating ourselves. The time is now to exercise the ghost of low self-esteem. You know, Africa has many things. We have talked about our mineral resources. We've talked about our arable land. We have talked about many things. But from where I sit, the greatest African resource is the human resource. You know, Africa has been so wronged by other civilizations. We were the enablers of the first industrial revolution. When our ancestors were taken to work in the farms in Europe, we enabled that revolution. Right now, we are enabling the fourth industrial revolution and the fifth industrial revolution. That is why they have talent visas, because they are taking our talent. If it is not nurses, it is our IT gurus. If it is not our IT gurus, it is our engineers. And we are gleefully letting them away. I see our heads of state saying, we have signed a contract to take our workers to Saudi Arabia, modern day slavery. And you know, just this morning, my wife sent me a proverb from Turkey that when you elect a clown, and you think that he will be a king, what he does is to convert the kingdom into a circus. And I am suggesting to us that that is part of the African problem because it starts with political hygiene. Most of Africa is suffering because we do not have democracies. We have kakistocracies. And kakistocracies are governments by our very worst. This is what we must deal with and this is what we must say. Who do we elect into our public offices? Because, as I've said before, when you allow hyenas to take care of goats, why should you be surprised when the goats are eaten? <laughs> this is the same. And Africa is only going to realize our potential in all areas when by dint of choice, we enable and allow our best men and women to serve in different areas. I've heard it being said, about Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore 
I've heard it being suggested about Mahathir Mohammed in Malaysia. I've heard it being said about Japan. I've heard it being said about other countries. But there was a conscious decision on the part of those individuals and the followership. We always talk about leaders, but we never talk about the followers. The followers must also style up. Africans, on average, are some, for some reason, attracted to thieves. Africans are, for some reason, attracted to men and women who cannot serve. And when they are not served, then they complain. When Africans are told, choose you now whom we shall release, Jesus of Nazareth or Barabbas, they say, release Barabbas. And when Barabbas behaves like Barabbas, they say, why are you not behaving like Christ? It cannot be done. And this is what we must do. And I am submitting to us that it can be done and it should be done. I know a number of African countries and I travel this continent sufficiently to know that there are African countries that are doing well. They are trying. There is no nation without trials and tribulation. We are fond of talking about the United States of America as an exemplar of that which is good and bad. When they said in 1776 that they held certain truths to be self-evident, that all men were born equal, that they were endowed by their creator with certain and alienable right, that among those were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, were blacks included? No, they were not. Did they not fight a civil war? Yes, they did. Are they not frustrating people until 1963? Did George Floyd, was he not killed only recently? There is not a single nation without trials and tribulation. And we must therefore remind ourselves that we have the wherewithal to catapult Africa into a different orbit. And Nyerere of Tanzania once said, we must also define what development means. And he said, Development does not mean necessarily the building of skyscrapers. There is nothing wrong with that. But let the Americans go to the moon. We are going to provide water to our villages. We must define what development means. And once we define what development means and we define ourselves, then Africa shall realize our potential. In 1996, Tabombeki talked about an African. Who is an African? Who are you? Define yourself first. The Chinese define themselves. The Indonesians define themselves. The Koreans define themselves. We must define ourselves and begin to believe in our institutions. You know, and I see it in this part of the world. When we want to look at our economy, we say, what does, the, what does Moody say? And Moody is very moody when they come to Africa. <laughs> Moody's. Can the Department of Economics at Unilag not do that? Can't they? McKinsey, an American outfit. They are the ones who come here and tell us how our economy is behaving. When the American dollar as much as sneezes, the Naira goes into a coma. Why? 63 years after independence in Nigeria, 66 in Ghana, 61 in Kenya and many other countries, we still believe that somebody else's currency is what must define us. 63 years after independence, we are still importing chicken as if our chicken forgot how to lay eggs. The time is now for Africa to ask fundamental questions. Because if you ask the wrong questions, you'll get the wrong answers. And I'm suggesting to us that Africa is already asking those questions. You know, in the year 2013, African heads of states and government sat in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. That was during the chairmanship of South Africa's in Kosaza and Adlamini Zuma. And they decided that we can no longer continue to live in this muck and mire. 
Africa must know progress. And they came up with Africa Agenda 2063. My sister spoke to it so very ably and eloquently and passionately. What we don't say is that during that week, Nkosaza and Adlamini Zuma wrote an apology letter to Kwame Nkrumah. Telling Kwame, we apologize. What we are doing now, you saw in 1963. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Now we are living through Africa Agenda 2063. We are living through the sustainable development goals. And I'm not a Jewish prophet nor related to one. But I can confirm to you we will not fulfill any one of them. You cannot in the nature of things engage the reverse gear and then think you'll reach your destination. You cannot. And that is what most African countries have done. So the time is now, as the cliche goes, when you are in a hole, you stop digging. And Africa must stop digging. And if we stop digging and we look at what we have, Africa Continental Free Trade Area says that we are going to trade amongst ourselves in the world. Africa trades ourselves at best at 20%. Europe at about 70%, North America possibly 65%, Asia now going to 60%, Latin America going to 55%, Africa 20%. What must we do? We must stop certain things that stand in our way, conflict. Look at Africa as I speak to you. Look at Sudan. For the last two months, there is no economic activity in Sudan. They are destroying what they once built. Even if you wanted to trade, who do you trade with? Generating as at now 2.5 million refugees. I do not hear the voices of African leaders, no. Their silence is eloquent. And when they speak, they speak mutedly in sanitized languages and people are dying. Children who ought to be vaccinated in Sudan are not getting vaccinated. Here in your neighborhood in Cameroon, children have not gone to school for the last many years. Conflict. In northern Mali, the country is divided de facto into two. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, 120 armed groups, yet it is the busiest airspace in the continent of Africa. Minerals are being taken away to Europe and America. Central African Republic, the same. Libya, the same. Several months ago, I wrote to the chair of the African Union and all African heads of state and said, convene a meeting with only one agenda item. What can we do to save Africa from this slide? Only four replied. That is the state of the continent of Africa. We must deal with the basic things. We must solve conflict. We must change our governance. Because if we don't deal with the question of governance, we are going nowhere Africa has become a continent where after every election there is conflict because the pursuit of power is the cutthroat competition where throats are actually cut. And when the SMO was here and he consulted the oracles, he discovered that we have a problem in that direction and that the sooner we resolve that, the safer we will be. Africa can rise and Africa will rise. But it's not going to rise by prayer and fasting. We must pray and fast, but it will not happen. Because the last time I checked, even those of you who are believers, when Abraham was taken from Ur of the Chaldeans and given Canaan, it was not on a silver platter. He had to fight the Canaanites. He had to fight the Philistines. That is the nature 
of divine instruction. Go ye and subdue the world by the sweat of thy brow. The kitchen where they make manna was closed. Manna will no longer come. Because you must now make your manna. And it is our duty, therefore, as Africans to begin to rethink the younger generation. You know, there is a saying in Chichewa in Malawi that more precious than our children are our children's children. So when we are doing these things, we must remind ourselves that we are doing for this generation and generations yet to be born. When my good sister was speaking, she started in 1969 about the education, we were alive. Then you came to the year 2023 and we are alive. But when you came to the year 2077, knowing as we do that we are not immortal, we shall be assumed into heaven. Some of you who will be alive, you'll be old and possibly stupid and not very useful to anybody. <laughs> This is why we say it is intergenerational. So, brethren, what we must now do is to ask ourselves, then what do we do? Beyond the rhetoric, what do we do? And what is beautiful in Africa now, not only in the continent of Africa, is that there is a consciousness. You know, I'm in a church setting, and sometimes it is good to remind you, for those of you who believe and believe rightly, even in the Bible, sometimes those who are saying the right things think that they are the only ones, thinking in silo. You remember Elijah going and saying, but Lord, I'm the only one who has not bowed to Baal. He was told, no. No, there are 7,000 others. And as I travel across Africa, there are 7,000 others. Today, I've seen many of them. Today, I've had the honor and privilege of listening to many of them. One enlightened more than the other. One more passionate than the other. Talking about what we can do. And talking about the place of Nigeria in that space. Times without number have talked about Nigeria and reminded Nigerians that the day you become great, that is the day Africa becomes great. When I hear Nigeria economists and politicians telling me that the GDP of Nigeria is 500 billion United States dollars and that therefore it is the biggest economy in the world. I am reminded of the words of Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, my friend, when he says, in a debate between dwarfs, what is the value of one dwarf saying I'm taller than the other dwarfs? <laughs> you are still a dwarf. This Nigeria, this Nigeria is capable in five years of becoming a three trillion GDP economy. The fundamentals are there. The fundamental, talk of human resource. And I think it is my sister, you go to anywhere in the world. Tell me, engineering, artificial intelligence, space, Nigerians. The saying goes, if you go to any part of the world and you do not find a Nigerian, run away from there. <laughs> because there is nothing to be done there. It is these Nigerians who will move the country. I keep on reminding my Nigerian friends, you say you are 220 million. No, you are not. I suspect you are 300 million. And if my suspicion is correct, you owe this region and this continent the talent. You know, when people talk about instability in Nigeria, I ask them, can you handle refugees from Nigeria? Can you? You cannot. They'll overwhelm the entire West Africa. So it is in Africans' need, genuine desire that Af Nigeria remains great and becomes great. All the ingredients are there. 
writing in 1983, Chinua Achebe, in his book, The Trouble with Nigeria, said that it is simply and squarely a problem of leadership. That is an African problem, and I also want to say it is also a problem of followership. Before the Ezemwe started speaking, he talked about what is expected of him in the village. When you are appointed into a public office in Africa, they actually expect you to be a thief. And if you don't steal, they say you are not wise. So in the minds of many people in Africa, Abuja and Lagos are hunting grounds where they send their sons and daughters to steal, to take antelopes, which they share in the village. That thinking must change because service for humanity is what we must look at. And I have no doubt in my mind that Africa can do it. When I look at Africa and I look at Nigeria, I see an Africa that is capable of rising because our sons and daughters now present in the continent and even in the diaspora. You go and see the Africans in the diaspora, whether they are in Antigua and Barbuda, and my good friend here, the ambassador of Antigua and Barbuda, Wallace Williams, Trinidad and Tobago, will agree with me in that regard. You go to St. Vincent's and Grenadines, you go to Jamaica, everybody now wants to come and invest in Africa. But we must make the circumstances right. So we must improve our politics. We must make our laws enabling. We must improve our agriculture. We must improve our health. We must improve our education system. We must improve the quality of the environment so that we stop our young men and women dying in the Mediterranean Sea, dying off the coast of Dhaka, going into modern day slavery in Saudi Arabia in that part of the world. It can't be done. We have seen it done during our lifetime. We have seen South Korea do it. We have seen China do it. We are seeing India do it. We can see Indonesia doing it. We have seen Vietnam after the war doing it. And within the continent of Africa, there are other examples. We have seen Rwanda rise like a phoenix during our lifetime. We have seen Botswana do it. We have seen Cabo Verde do it. We have seen Mauritius doing it. It can be done. And if we agree that it can be done, what we must now do is to take a solemn vow. And that solemn vow must come from these words spoken by Julius Kambaraga Nyerere on the sixth day of March 1997 in Accra, Ghana, when he was called upon to be the guest on the 40th anniversary of Ghana's independence. This is what he said, and I say this, then I shut up and sit down. Mwalimu said, when Kwame Nkrumah told us in 1963 that we ought to unite, we agreed with him. And we did not for one moment believe that unity in and of itself will, will solve our problems. What we believe that unity will make our voices as Africans to be respected. Because the rest of the world is not bothered about our Ghanaianness or our Tanzanianness. He did not say this, but I'm adding, but our Nigerianness or Ugandanness, the rest of the world only knows about Africa. The time is now. Our generation fought the colonialists and brought what we thought was independence, but they gave us the crown without the jewels. But of all the sins that we have committed, there is a single sin that we must never commit, the sin of giving up, the sin of despair. And each one of us must remember that we have a role to play. We have a role to play because if the ocean is to exist, the droplets must be good. If the forest is to exist, the trees must be good. Play your part and let the results be the testimony of your efforts. God bless you. <laughs>